Wes Wilson, this is Rick Samarano. We're doing another uh, rendition of Community Matters. And today I'm here with my special guest. He is uh, from the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Rela uh, Regulations. He's the Chief of Staff for, uh, of the General Counsel. His name is Greg White. And let's thank, thank, you, thank him for being here. Hi. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate good, it. Good to meet you. Well, it's great to, uh, great to be out here. I didn't have to travel too far. No. <laughs> Next town over. So uh, we've been talking a little bit um, before the cameras started to roll and uh, told me a little bit of, of some of what sure. you do. And, and uh, man, it's a crazy world out there. It you is. Know, it uh, is. One, one of the comments you made, and it's so true, that someone doesn't have to come up and pick your pocket anymore. Someone doesn't actually have to even physically be anywhere near you to basically to identity theft. steal yeah. your, 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 not only your identity, but steal your livelihood, steal, sure. steal everything yeah. you, you've got. A absolutely. So, that's so a frightening. It certainly is, and that's a big focus of what our office is uh, 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 focusing in on these days. Um, but I, I generally uh, begin by giving a quick overview of our office because a lot of times when people hear uh, consumer uh, affairs, they automatically think the Attorney General's office. And we're a separate state agency. Um, consumer protection is a big part of what the Attorney General's office does. They have a, a bureau that oversees that. But again, we're a separate uh, state agency and we have a uh, fairly broad mandate. We uh, oversee five uh, agencies as well as having our own individual mandate within the Office of Consumer Affairs. Um, we oversee the division of banks which regulates all state chartered banks and credit unions, uh, mortgage companies, debt collectors, amongst other things. Oh, wow. uh, we oversee the division of insurance, which regulates uh, homeowners, uh, auto insurance, uh, health care insurance, amongst other things. Uh, we regulate the uh, division of standards. And um, a lot of people don't know what they're about, but if you go to a gas pump, uh, you'll see a sticker on there. And that sticker has either been put on by the town one of our state inspectors, which goes out and inspects the fuel pumps mm. to make sure that what's being advertised is in fact going into your, into your gas tank. Mm. Um, in addition to that, they uh, inspect uh, fuel delivery trucks, they uh, inspect uh, price scanners, uh, they uh, uh, oversee auto body repair shops as well as auctioneers. Mm. Uh, we oversee the Department of Telecommunic Telecommunications and Cable, which regulates the telecommunications and cable industry. And then finally, we oversee the Division of Professional Licensure, which basically regulates 375,000 tradespeople throughout Massachusetts, from electricians to chiropractors to veterinarians. Uh, um, it's a, quite a, a pretty broad mandate. And uh, they license them and, and also oversee a complaint process. And they recently initiated uh, an online process where uh, a tradesperson doesn't have to come into Boston or mail it in, they can do it online. It's called e-licensing and we just uh, initiated that um, this past uh, month. Um, so those are the five agencies that we oversee in addition to which uh, we have our own specific mandate. Um, we oversee the do not call list um, along with the Attorney General's office. Uh, basically we're a depository. They, they send it into us uh, the Attorney General's Office does the enforcement end of that. In addition to that, we oversee the, um, uh, the um, data breach, which we're going to talk more about. Mm -hmm. uh, if, in fact, you hold um, confidential or uh, personal information of a Massachusetts consumer, your business, and that information's been breached, you're required to notify our office, along with the Attorney General's Office, the nature of the breach, how many residents in Massachusetts have been impacted, and what you've done to rectify the situation. Uh, in addition to that, we oversee the, uh, the Lemon Law uh, for new and pre-owned cars, the arbitration program. And one of our most important programs is the Home Improvement Contracting Pro Program and Guarantee Fund. And basically, what, what the way that works is in Massachusetts, if you're doing home improvement work, and for the most part, on an individual's house. Uh, and for the most part, uh, most of the work out there requires a home improvement contracting registration. So you're required to register with our office. Um, you pay a, uh, a nominal fee, and then you pay a fee into the guarantee fund, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, um, and that allows you to uh, work in Massachusetts doing home improvement contracting work. Um, 
in the past, um, uh, it was a program that uh, wasn't, um, we didn't do a lot of follow through. So uh, we've uh, recently underwent a uh, public awareness campaign using social media and Facebook. Uh, we're working with all the town building inspectors and basically we've asked them that they, before they issue a permit, that they make sure that the contractor is properly registered. And we advise uh, consumers and homeowners not to pull the permit because if you do so, that uh, prevents you from accessing, uh, 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 having access to the guarantee fund. Uh, so that's basically the home improvement contracting program. And, and again, the way it works is if you enter into a contract with a registered home improvement contractor and you're agreed by the process, provided you meet the criteria, uh, you can uh, file against the guarantee fund and recoup up to $10,000. So it's a, basically a safeguard uh, for consumers out there. But again, it has to be a registered contractor and you had to meet the, uh, the, the criteria in order to be able to access that. Um, so that's one of our most important programs. And again, we're working with all town building inspectors. We're working with town clerks um, that when they issue a, a, a DBA that they notify the individual, if he's a home improvement contractor, of their responsibility. And we're working with uh, the Department of Public Safety, which is, issues the CSLs to, again, notify individuals who uh, have their CSL that also are required to have an HIC to, in fact, register uh, with our office. Um, so that's one of our most important programs. And lastly, uh, we uh, oversee a consumer hotline. And we have, as we talked about before the show, we have four co-ops uh, from Northeastern. And they are basically, they're with us um, for six months uh, out of the year. So we have a, we had a new group starting in July. And um, those uh, uh, students take calls Monday through Friday, hundreds of calls from consumers. And they're not lawyers, they're not there to offer legal advice, but what they are is they're to answer questions for consumers. And if they're not able to answer that, they will direct the consumer to the appropriate agency. And uh, towards that end, they keep uh, a log of all the various calls they get. And one of the things that we were talking about before the show is um, uh, identity theft and the various scams out there, you know, which is, which is a big part, um, uh, a big focus of our office. And the way that works is um, we receive calls and we track the various scams as well as uh, the, the, the most prominent types of identity theft. Uh, one of the things that uh, we um, advise consumers to do is, is protect your information. You know, uh, we are talking again before the show and um, your information is out there. You know, if you've accessed Facebook or what, what were you talking about before, MySpace? Well, my, MySpace, that's ancient history, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's still active out there. Right, exactly. So you, your information is everywhere and um, you need to protect your information. And one of the things we advise consumers to do is um, protect your password, change it often. One of the biggest ways in which people access personal information is through hacking into someone's computer. And uh, so we advise consumers to um, change up your password often and don't use an, uh, a, a name or a password that can be easily associated with you. Uh, recently, my uh, brother who lives in Europe uh, called me, well actually he emailed me and he said, uh, you need to change your password. Uh, your system's been hacked. Uh, so I, I went in and I, I entered a six digit number followed by two words that couldn't be associated with me. And uh, recently, my son and I were running a half marathon in Philadelphia, and right before the gun went off, um, I was trying to get onto iTunes, and um, he said to me, give me your password. Um, so by the time he entered it, it took so long, uh, the gun had gone off and thousands of runners had <laughs> run by us. Uh, but the fact is, no one's going to get in, uh, hack into my system, yeah. you know. So that's one of the things that we do is we advise uh, consumers to, um, to safeguard your password, uh, I uh, put together a password that can't be associated with you and, and change it often. Uh, and if you work for a business or a government agency, IT is constantly telling you you need to change your password or you won't have access uh, to your information. So um, that's, that's an important... Um, uh, what, I, what I found is a lot of people will use like a, uh, an email address 
as their, oh, I forgot my password, go to this email site. Right. But as soon as that email site gets hacked, right. you're, you're, you're right down the same. In, in fact, if that, if that email site, you know, I happen to use Yahoo. I've had a Yahoo account since the late 90s or whatever. Sure. Um, if Yahoo gets hacked, yep. well, then almost everything that I've, that I've ever logged on to in my life it can be uh, accessed through that through yeah, that account. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's it's a very dangerous thing. When I, I do IT work, and I usually tell people if they're going to um, uh, if they want to protect themselves, worst comes to worst, you write it on a piece of paper, yep. and then you keep it in a drawer, or you keep exactly it, you know somewhere yeah. close to your computer, so that you know if you again if they're changing it frequently, and it's something that's not associated with you, so it's not sticking in your brain. Write it down somewhere so that you can go to it, so that you always have a file or something absolutely. close to you that's not on the web. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and, and and that's important. I mean, when you look at all the various entities, uh, private as well as government agencies that have been hacked, you know, Target, TJ Maxx. Uh, we had uh, I worked in the Bush administration, and um, last year uh, we were notified that um, the agency that basically oversees the, the personnel for the federal government, which consists of th hundreds of thousands of people, their system that had been hacked, mm. uh, OPM, Office of Personal Management, and with that, uh, everyone's information, you know. And in fact, that not only was I a victim of that, but my mortgage company notified me last summer that uh, I had been a victim of a data breach. Mm. Um, so. You know, years ago, um, again, we, we were talking about before the show, um, I spent my early career, uh, 14 years, as a prosecutor, 10 of which was here in Worcester County. Mm -hmm. And back then, identity theft consisted of someone losing their wallet and someone using that information. Now, uh, someone doesn't even have to leave their home. They can be operating halfway across the world and gain access to your information. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's not a question of whether or not you're going to be a victim of identity theft. That, that's a given. The question is how often it's going to happen. So, you know, someone asked me the other day, what's the best way to protect yourself? And I said, you can go back into the, the dark ages. You, you can use cash, uh, and not access a computer, um, but that's unrealistic. You know, at the end of the day, people um, need to, to utilize those devices. Um, but you can take steps to protect your information along those lines. Uh, another type of identity theft that we see a lot of are dumpster divers. Are you familiar with dumpster divers? Yeah, they, they go after the, it's usually after the shredded material that you've uh, thrown away. Well, actually, they go after the information before it's shredded. A lot okay. of people don't have, um, they don't have um, shredding machines. They'll just take old tax returns, they'll throw them out, uh, statements, bank statements, uh, some of which contains your personal information, your social security number, your date of birth, and it'll literally go through your trash and they'll access that information. Mm -hmm. So we advise consumers to utilize a paper shredder. You can get a variety of different stores. It's cheap money and, and it protects your... My, my, my mother shreds every Does she? piece of anything that has her name on it, yep. she shreds it and then we burn it in the fireplace. All right, yeah, that's, all, that's, that's, <laughs> so, that's taking you so, to yeah, a, we're, we're, another... We're protected all the way around, but I mean, it, it could be... It could be it could be anything. It could be something from uh, the big Y. Right. You know, right. She's well, shredding. She shreds hey, everything. Uh, you, it, it, it keeps her busy. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but in any event, uh, investing in shredded does help. And and one of the biggest um, areas of identity theft are, that we're seeing is with skimming devices. And we talked about that before the show. They're showing up in a variety of different areas. Um, the Division of Standards, which inspects fuel pumps throughout Massachusetts. Um, they've been getting calls in and around Boston here in Worcester County where they're finding these uh, skimming devices. And what they'll do is they'll go in in the dead of night, they'll uh, hack open the, the, the uh, fuel pump, and they will put a skimming device in there. And what that will do is basically it's downloading your information. So, you know, here's a, a, a photograph of um, a skimming device. They basically put it over the facade and that's capturing your information. Mind blowing that the brazenness of it to, to put a device, an yeah. electronic device, in some arbitrary spot yeah. like a like a like a gas pump. Absolutely, and, and, and get your information. Yeah. just it, it blows my mind that people do it have and, gone, and, have gone and, to that well, length. But there is a group operating um, out of Eastern Europe. We just uh, basically they were in the South Shore 
um, they had been uh, hitting up uh, eight, uh, gas um, fuel pumps and putting them in, in these fuel pumps and they were stopped on a, a, a motor vehicle charged and found that there was an open warrant and they found these skimming devices. They had Texas plates on there and they're going around and basically what they'll do is they'll put the, uh, the device in and years ago um, when a, a proprietor of a gas station found it, they would notify the local authorities and they would come and they would set up surveillance. Nowadays, they access it through Bluetooth, so it's, um, they don't even have to come back and get the device. It's cost of doing business. And um, so what we tell consumers is that when you, when you go to a, a fuel pump, you'll notice that there's a, a, a tamper um, a, a sticker, sticker yeah. across yeah, it. And if that. that's been breached or broken, then you should notify the proprietor. Um, uh, we just uh, recently had a cybersecurity conference, and one of our speakers was uh, the uh, one of the members of the FBI in the Boston office. And he was talking about an investigation that they recently conducted, involved a mom and pop store in Upper State New York. Uh, it was a high tourism area. Um, they had put these skimming devices in, and basically. Um, uh, it was a group operating out of Eastern Europe. Um, they retrieved all the information and then they disseminated it worldwide with the caveat not to release it until they were given a certain date and time, at which point they gave them the green light and within hours millions of dollars had been lost. Mm. Um, so, and in addition to that, it's not just on fuel pumps. Uh, they're showing up at ATM machines. We had um, a situation in the South Shore where at an ATM machine they had found skimming devices. Uh, there was an incident uh, this past year uh, in which a correctional officer was attending a concert in, down in Providence, Rhode Island, went into an ATM machine uh, to take out some cash before the concert and noticed that the facade on it was a bit uh, uh, offset. And so he pulled it off and there was a skimming device. Uh, we don't advise um, consumers to do that. Uh, there's some important forensic evidence, so what we suggest they do is notify the bank or the proprietor, and they will come, um, they will notify the local authorities, which many times will look, uh, notify the FBI or the Secret Service, and um, they'll conduct an investigation. So is, is, is the Bluetooth technology, is that pretty much standard with these skimming devices? Many times, yeah, person? unless they're old school, but um, you know, most of them are uh, very sophisticated. Well, they must be, I mean, my Android does everything nowadays. I'm, I must be able to pick up that Bluetooth signal you, and you, know when you know what? something that's... There, there may be that potential, um, but you know, just being more um, uh, aware of the situation. Yeah. Um, and, and not only are they showing up on uh, in gas pumps and ATM machines, they're showing up on scanners in department stores. Uh, they also utilize handheld devices and basically what they'll do is they'll go through an airport or a bus terminal or a mall and they'll brush up against you and they're, they're downloading the information uh, from your wallet, your credit cards, into the skimming devices. So. Yeah. Uh, we came out with um, a protective sleeve. Uh, you put your credit card in there and basically that protects um, uh, your credit card from um, the skimming devices. In so, so, so this material is just like what when they ship uh, um, memory or, or, or RAM or whatever for a computer. It's a, an electrostatic uh, type of material. Or yes, that yeah, blocks, absolutely. Uh, and um, in fact, one of your staff showed me uh, her uh, device, I get, they get uh, this at one of the local entities. Um, a little bulkier, but probably uh, providing a little more level of protection. I have to imagine that every wallet is going to be lined with one of these at some point. At I some point, yeah. And we've, we've even come, in out, uh, come out with sleeves for passports. Um, since 2007, there's, they put a chip in your passport and as your all your personal uh, information. Um, Again, they use these skimming devices to, to rub up uh, against you at airports. Uh, so we've come up with a, uh, a protective sleeve to put your passport in there as well. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, the banking industry just came out with a chip and pin, uh, which basically encrypts your information. Um, not all businesses have it, um, um, but uh, those who don't uh, run the risk of um, being exposed to liability should their system be compromised. Um, uh, so skimming devices are, are, are a big part of the identity theft um, that we're seeing throughout Massachusetts and actually throughout New England. 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, the identity theft that, we're, that we focus in on, um, our uh, consumer hotline advocates take calls involving a variety of different scams out there. And um, um, I like to talk about the most common types of scams that, that folks are seeing out there. The first one is the IRS scam, which most people are familiar with. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, I'm sure your mom has probably gotten calls. Um, I'm one of the few people who has a landline. Um, and um, this past week, uh, the last week, I received five calls from a group operating out in New York. There's a group in New York and one in Washington, uh, Seattle, Washington. And basically they're calling individuals, many of whom are senior citizens, and they're saying that they're with the Internal Revenue Service, um, that you need to contact this number uh, to avoid uh, criminal prosecution for back taxes. And what they'll do is they'll get you on the line and they'll basically uh, convince you that they're with the Internal Revenue Service and that you need to wire $5,000 in order to avoid criminal prosecution. The reality is the IRS doesn't operate that way. They don't make phone calls. Um, you should, if you receive a call um, from this group, uh, purporting to be the inter uh, Internal Revenue Service, hang up and call the Endover office if, if you're not sure. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time it's, it's a scam out there. Again, the IRS doesn't operate that way. So the IRS scam is, is one of the um, biggest types of um, scammers that we're seeing out there and, and they're very brazen. We had a, a woman in our office whose mother had received a, a dozen phone calls within a 24-hour period. They were using profanity, uh, they were harassing her, and I had one of my uh, attorneys in my office call and, and, and inform the uh, individuals that the next call they were going to be receiving is from the Attorney General's office, and that those phone calls ceased. But they'll continue to call. Well, I, I've they, noticed they have some information. It's not like they just cold call a phone oh, number yeah, and just yeah, say, they, hey, they, we're yep. so-and-so. They actually have Well, they have your number, they have your your name and they might have some other information but again as we were talking about uh, this before the show your information's out there you know I mean one of the biggest scams is the grandparents scam uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that uh, basically what they'll do is they'll call a grandparent and they'll say your daughter who's uh, your granddaughter who's studying in Paris France um, has been detained by the local authorities you need to wire Five thousand or ten thousand dollars to this number in order to have her released. And people say, "Well, how, how do they get that information?" They can go on Facebook. It's 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 amazing how much information mm. can be gotten uh, from um, from social media. Uh, I, I I was playing on Xbox. This was a few years ago, but I was playing on Xbox, and I met somebody playing some game I was uh, playing at the time. And within, I want to say, less than five minutes, he was able to bring up my profile on uh, Facebook. Uh, he got a pic he's got a picture of me. He's got he's got picture of pictures of my children. Oh yeah. He's got yeah. Picture, he, he knows my whole basically knows my whole family within 5 minutes of speaking to him on Absolutely. On, uh, online on, because on, it's on the Xbox. it's all out there, you know. So um, they retrieve this information and then they call, you know, many times senior citizens. Um, we had a, a member of our office whose uh, mother-in-law lives in Texas and she received um, a, a call uh, from this group saying that uh, her grandson who was um, studying in Atlanta, Georgia had been detained and that they needed, she needed to wire, um, I think it was a, a small amount as, you know, relatively speaking as this group um, in, in terms of how they operate, uh, I think it was $2,500 or, or $3,000. Uh, nevertheless, that's, that's a significant amount for, for most people. Mm. Um, and uh, she was um, uh, requested to wire this money. She went to a local um, uh, Western Union and the guy, the individual behind the desk um, saw it for what it was, a scam. And he said, ma'am, I'd love to take your money, but you're being scammed. Uh, so she promptly left there and went to another uh, entity and they took the money and she was out the $3,000. And so, um, again, uh, when in doubt, uh, pick up the phone, you know. Um, uh, but the grandparent scam is, is one of the most common types of scams that we're seeing. And many times 
they, they uh, focus in on the, the senior citizen population. Um, we also have the fake lottery scam. Are you familiar with, I with think, that? I, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. Basically, they'll reach out to you and they'll say that you've won a million dollars, you've won a half a million dollars. Well, you, you, usually it's pounds or, or oh, some it, other type it, of it, currency. It, and it, you've got to, it could uh, be. I mean, they're you, you've operating. You have to pay a, a certain fee. You have to pay taxes on yeah. it. And basically, they'll say, you know, you need to pay the taxes and then wire the money and then we'll send you the, the balance. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's a good tactic or the right tactic, but I said, well, if I won the lottery, Take out a full-page ad in my local newspaper, right. telling my community that I've won this money. Right, right. And if you do that, then I'll see about sending yeah. you some cash. In the reality, that's and not going to happen. Yeah, they don't. No. Yeah, they don't do that. And yet, people are <laughs> people are um, victimized by this all the time. The Boston Globe uh, did an article uh, this past about six months ago um, on this issue, and they talked about a number of in individuals who had been victim of the scam. One of, an in, one of the individuals was a guy who had received um, four calls or, or emails from a group, uh, three uh, separate groups, saying that, they, that he had won the lottery. And then he received a fourth uh, call or an email from uh, a fourth group who said, listen, we understand that you've won three lotteries. Um, by law, you can't collect on more than one uh, lottery in any given year unless you join our association. And, you need to pay thousands of dollars. He did, and, and he was out thousands and thousands of dollars. So we advise consumers, if it's too good to be true, in all likelihood it is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, this is uh, probably one scam that you're not familiar with, the One Ring scam. Uh, I wasn't familiar with it as well, but um, I received a call on my cell phone about a year ago, and uh, it rang once, and they hung up. Well, if you like most people, you're wondering who called you, so you call them back. Well, there's a group operating out of the Caribbean in which uh, somehow they access your information. They'll call you, they'll hang up and with, the, uh, with the understanding that you're going to call back. And um, you call back, they keep you on the line. The longer they have you on the line, the longer they ring up a, a bill. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's called the One Ring Scam, and it's, um, it's operating out there. So these are the more um, uh, uh, common types of scammers that we're seeing out there. Some of them have been around for years, like the IRS, the grandparents, but people are still being victimized by that. So we well, the, the, the one scam that I, that I run into, and maybe it's because I'm an IT person, but I get the, um, someone calling saying, I've got a virus on my computer. Yes, yeah. Scam. Yeah. And uh, usually what I try to do is I'll keep that person on the line for as long as humanly possible. And I start asking the dumbest questions. Yeah. So I, where's, the, where's the start button on my computer? How do I, you know? Right. So I'll keep them, you know, you know, maybe five minutes or whatever, if I've got the time uh, talking to them. And then finally I say, well, at least I made you wait, waste time with me for the last five minutes. Right. And you're not scamming somebody else. Right. And then I usually just let them yeah, off, let them off yep. the hook or whatever. But they'll, they always say, oh, you've got a virus on your computer. I go, well, which one? I've got... 60 of them and at, well, at my disposal and they're like oh your your uh your ibm computer oh okay right well there's yeah. a group operating out there that actually will do they'll they'll hack into your system and they'll say that you need to wire two thousand dollars or we're going to delete everything off your system mm -hmm. and uh, local police departments have been uh, a victim of this scam and um you yeah, know i was talking to a, a former colleague who's chief of one of the local departments and he said yeah we were um hit up with this uh, with this uh, situation and it was going to cost us thousands and thousands of dollars to have an IT guy come in and and um, basically undo what they had done and in the end it's cheaper to pay the a lot of times it's five hundred dollars that they're looking for um, so you know as we were discussing before the show there are people out there who are looking to scam people every day and as soon as they as soon as folks identify an issue and address that issue, they move on and come up with another type of scam. You know, what, what was it, P.T. Barnum that said the sucker was born? Sucker born every, every minute. Every, yep, yeah. exactly. So, um, again, we advise consumers if it's too good to be true, it, it probably is. Um, and if you have been a victim of identity theft, there are ways that you can, uh, uh, steps that you can take to protect yourself. You can um, go and uh, request a credit report. Um, there are three major 
credit reporting agencies by law, federal law, are required to provide one free credit report per year. And you should check that periodically. Um, recently, my wife and I were having some work done on our home. And um, the, uh, one of the, mem uh, the staff members for the contractor um, uh, noted my office and we were talking about identity theft and she said, oh, recently I went to uh, refinance my, my home and I learned that someone had obtained my uh, personal information and had purchased a condominium in my name, had purchased a, um, or at least a brand new vehicle in her name. Mm -hmm. She wasn't even aware of it and she wouldn't be aware of it until they started defaulting on the payments and then the bank or the uh, um, um, loan company would be going after her. Uh, so we advise consumers to utilize um, uh, these free credit reports and check it off. And, and then, again, if you've been uh, a victim of identity theft, you can put a credit freeze on your, um, um, uh, on your report uh, to prevent uh, them accessing certain information. So there's steps that you can take to protect uh, yourself, but in the end, uh, we advise consumers just to use common sense. Well, the, 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 I think the big thing of it is that these people go after everybody. It's, mm -hmm. it, you know, I, a lot of times I think, well, you know, I'm, I'm close to the poverty line or, or yeah. whatever, or even senior citizens, I'm living on off a, fist, a fixed income, yeah. so I'm, I'm never going to get scammed in that way. But these people go after everybody. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever they, money they can get yeah. from whoever is out there. They don't, discrim they don't no, discriminate, they don't. you know. Um, I was talking about before the show about this entity, uh, Unemployment Assist, that um, um, was operating out of Idaho. Um, we just learned of one complaint in Massachusetts. Basically, they're focusing on individuals who are either applying for unemployment assistance or who uh, are who are on unemployment assistance, and they'll reach out to them, asking them to provide personal information in order to be able to. Um, uh, maintain your benefits or have access to unemployment uh, benefits and basically then, then they're going to compromi compromise your information. Wow. So, uh, so, so, here, so here you are at a, at a point where you're unemployed and yeah. you're, and they're you're, still you're, looking you're, tri to you're trying to sustain existence yep. and, uh, and you got people that are, are looking to... Yep, absolutely. Wow. And so it's, um, you know, again, it's not a question of whether or not you're personal information is going to be compromised. It's a question of when and how many times. So um, you can take steps to um, protect your information and then you can take steps if in fact the information has been compromised. So basically that's uh, uh, our agency, uh, that's our mandate, and those are the types of scams and uh, the most common types of identity thefts that we see. So, so how can people get in touch with your agency when they run into these situations Yep. Um, there's an, there's one eight eight one eight hundred number. Yep. Uh, they can call our uh, eight hundred number. It's one eight 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 two eight three three seven five seven. Or they can contact the Boston number, which is six one seven nine seven three eight seven eight seven. Or access our um, our website www.mass.gov/consumer. Um, and we have a variety of different uh, links on there to inform uh, the public. Uh, we have a, a page up there uh, that you can access to determine whether or not the contractor that you're looking to enter into a contract or the home improvement. That's, a, that, that's so important because yep. I, I don't know anyone that have had, that's, that's had a good experience <laughs> with a contract, unfortunately, because usually, you know, they'll find somebody on Craigslist or they'll find a friend of a friend. Yep. Well, and, um, there, there are a lot of terrific contractors out there, there are. but at the end of the day, uh, there are bad apples in every industry, and uh, unfortunately, those are the individuals that prey on folks, and that's why we have the Home Improvement Contracting Registration Program. We also have a complaint process, so if you've been aggrieved by the process, you can notify our office. We have hearing officers that conduct hearings, and they can uh, do one of a number of things. They can either dismiss the complaint as finding that there's no basis to it, or if they find that there is a basis for it, they can uh, find that contractor, they can spend, suspend that contractor's registration, or revoke their registration. Mm. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, there are a lot of fine contractors out there. We recently met with uh, the Mass Builders Association, and, and they want 
uh, their members to be compliant because it, uh, it, it's a matter of credibility. And at the end of the day, um, uh, most contractors out there are trying to do the, the right thing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, folks within that industry that are involved in specific type of home improvement contracting that they're not familiar with the law. Uh, recently, my wife and I had our uh, home painted and we had four area contractor, uh, uh, painting contractors come, some of whom have been in business 20, 25 years, had the workers comp, had the, uh, all the permits, but they didn't have their HIC registration and they weren't aware of it. So we, again, we did a public awareness campaign focusing, uh, part of the focus was on paint contractors to let them know their obligation. And under the law, if you're doing exter exterior paint painting, you're required to be registered. If you're doing interior painting, you're not required to be registered. But mm -hmm. again, you can go on our website and find out those individuals who are in fact registered. And, and uh, you only want to operate with an individual who has their HIC registration. Now, you're not really saving any money in the long run. No. In fact, you're exposing yourself and you're uh, preventing yourself uh, access to the guarantee fund if in fact you've been agreed by the process. If you're using an um, an unregistered uh, contractor. So, but that's uh, basically our offers. And um, again, we invite uh, your viewers to, if you have any questions or concerns, to contact our office, either the toll free number or go on our website. And uh, again, we're always uh, updating the information, and our goal is to inform and protect the consumers of Massachusetts. That's great. Well, uh, I'm I've definitely learned a lot today. Great, great. You probably <laughs> and, don't and want it. Hopefully, our viewers have, have, have as well because um, uh, you you guys have a lot a lot of responsibilities in those divisions and and the, the work that you do, and it's so extremely important. So I'm Absolutely. so glad that you took the time to uh, to educate us. Today. Great. That's well, thank awesome. thank you for having me. I appreciate cool. it. Well, good, pleasure. Good, good to meet you finally. Great. So West Wilson, there you go. That was Greg White. Uh, does great work, obviously, uh, very important work for us, and uh, hopefully you've learned something today, and if you haven't learned everything you need to learn, definitely check out their website or give their office a call, and they'll be more than glad to take care of you. Uh, this is Rich Samarano at Community Matters, West Boylston. See you next time.